Hello, hello. I am Karen Jean-François, and this is the Women in Data podcast, a podcast where every other week I interview some of the most inspiring women working in data. They discuss how data is used in various industries, share their knowledge and experience in the field, and equip you with tips to help you overcome challenges on your career and feel great. Let's get straight to it. We are back and I am super excited. Thank you so much for your patience during our break. And if you are new to the podcast, welcome. Lots has happened since our last episode with Holly Smith on returning to the office. First of all, I went home, so I sneaked out of the country to visit my family and it had been a while since I was last home, so I was super happy that I could go. I hope that if your family lives abroad, you were able to go to and spend some time with your loved ones. Podcast-wise, we have been busy, busy changing the podcast page. So if you feel like heading to womenindata.co.uk, have a look at the new podcast page. And we've also been aligning some fantastic guests for the rest of the year. Spoiler alert, coming soon will be episodes on how the advertising space has changed and what was the role of data there. And for example, as well, how data science is supporting cancer research, how to perform as an introvert, something around scaling. Well, just keep your eyes open for the next few episodes. All right, enough of that. Let's focus on our guest. I am joined today by Alina Timofiva, Associate Partner at Oliver Wyman, to talk about achieving your ambition and getting to the next step in your career. When I first spoke with Alina, I found her to be very inspiring and driven. And actually, I already started implementing some of the things we spoke about. Basically, Alina was raised in Russia to be a housewife, but wanted something else. And She made her way to the UK, where in just six years, she went from being a graduate analyst in Accenture to being a senior manager at KPMG and more recently, associate partner at Oliver Wyman. I think that just like success, ambition has different meanings for each of us. And in this episode, Alina shares her own version You will hear about her role and responsibilities, how she achieved such an exceptional growth and find tips on how to go for your dream promotion and negotiate your salary. Hi, Alina. Hi. Thanks a lot, Karen, for inviting me. It's my absolute pleasure. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today, especially because the topic we're going to talk about is such an important topic. And in the introduction, I said that some of the things we spoke about in the past, I, I started implementing them. And if you remember when we first spoke, you were talking about how you were trying to learn English and you were reading out loud as a practice. And I started doing that because I find my reading being very difficult and my pronunciation as well. And so I started doing about 15 minutes of reading out loud in the morning. And I think it made such a big different. So I'm really excited to hear about all your other tips. Sure. Some of the things, and it's maybe going back to my childhood, I wanted to study English, right? But I didn't quite know how. And you may have noticed that some of the Russian people, they have a very strong Russian accent when they speak English. So the way I was doing it, it wasn't just reading out loud. It was actually listening to the native speaker on a cassette. At the time, it was like a old VHS cassette, which you may remember. Yes, I do. <laughs> And it's stopping after every single phrase and trying to pronounce it in a similar way. And it was a very time-consuming exercise because it's pretty much like training. And I had to go through the same and same episode of cassette many, many times. So I would have, I don't know, 20 minutes of an episode every single day for a week till the time that I can literally copy the intonation. And what's really funny, my Russian has changed because I speak Russian with an English accent now. And when I come to Russia, people feel that I'm a foreigner, even though I've obviously lived and uh, stayed in Russia till I was 20. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's that's funny. But it definitely shows dedication and how you are able to do that. I like that. And before we get into achieving your ambitions and and really getting to the next step in your career, could you tell us a bit more about yourself, but also you're moving what are we speaking right now? We you're moving from KPMG to Oliver Wyman and I'm really curious to hear about how this happened and how you feel about it. Yeah, okay, sure. I mean, in Kim PMG, my role is really very diverse. So I'm a senior manager in KPMG focusing on data and cloud transformation. These are slightly different topics per se, but the specifics of my job is looking at the projects wider rather than deeper. So if I give you an example, I don't necessarily go and write a very detailed code or oversee other people doing it. I more think from the business problem, which the clients may have, and the challenge they may have is making their business more digital or more transformational. And then I come with suggestions of how they can use technology, data, analytics, innovation to actually help transform their customers. And this is a very interesting point, just because some of the people I met, they feel that, you know, data jobs are very specific, like you do a data analyst or a data scientist or a data engineer. Whereas in my role, I have been able to combine different aspects of it and make it broader and perhaps more interesting. In terms of my transition to Oliver Wyman, it's kind of along the same elements. Uh, So Oliver Wyman, they have a digital practice, which again looks at things broader in some of their instances. And my role would be similar in terms of identifying who are the clients, what sort of propositions we can pitch to them, helping win the work, helping deliver the work and grow the business, both for, you know, Oliver Wyman, but also for our clients and their customers. So if I understand well, your your role basically is everything around setting the relationship right with the client so that you can go and propose data solutions being analytics or data science or other things. Yes, so that's one of the things. But what is important, I'm embedded throughout the process. So I start by understanding what we can propose to the client, who are the clients, Uh, doing the proposal, doing the pitching, winning the work, doing the risk management around it, and then actually working with my team, which is usually a connected team of SMEs across the areas, not just the data, uh, to deliver the work and to measure the success. Sounds great. Uh, Sounds very intense as well, but also very interesting because as as you mentioned earlier, it's not going to be specific to data science or data analytics. You're really going to go and try to understand the business problems and how you can support your client, which is something I, I believe in analytics is very, very important because even when you're not in consultancy, understanding the business problem and how to approach it is definitely a game changer. And what I find really interesting is sometimes you see the business people who are very, very focused on their challenge and you have the technical people who know how to write the code, for example. But what I really love doing is bringing these two areas together. And I would say that it's probably a a unique skill in the market just because people tend to either be, you know, too business here, perhaps too technical, but it's actually this bringing together of these two parts makes the ultimate value to our clients and their customers. That's super interesting. So in terms of how you got there, we spoke a bit about you, how you learned English, which was already very rich in terms of of tips and how to do it. But you said that when you were a child, really, you wanted to change your surroundings. And also you wanted your life to be different than the prospect you you had. So how did you actually go about and, and do that? Just to give you a perspective, I am from Russia and I used to live in a smaller area called Sonsova, which is in Moscow. I had some challenges because I didn't have parents and I live with my grandmother and 
also perhaps there weren't so many prospects because it was the most mafia area in definitely in Moscow and perhaps in Russia. So there weren't a lot of expectations around me or my future. And I think in the start, it wasn't quite clear what I can do to achieve anything, partially because nobody in my family at the time actually had education and Perhaps they didn't see this wider, you know, career opportunities, how you can grow in your role or how you can develop in it. And as you said, Karen, I was brought up to be a housewife. But again, it's not like a wife of a rich guy. It's just like more focusing on the house because perhaps I'm not that good for wider work. And the way I have addressed it, I mean, I was always ambitious in the way that I wanted to have a better lifestyle. So I did want to move to perhaps a better area or potentially another country, even though I've never traveled. And what I thought would help me is studying well. So I was quite good at school. I won the Moscow Olympiad in maths, which is quite impressive just because Russia is great in mathematics generally. I think the main thing which made me stand out is I was willing to put the effort in and I was willing to get this excellence out, you know, by trying more, trying harder, maybe working longer. Um, whereas perhaps some of my peers or some of my friends, they would stop at a particular point. So they would try, try a little bit and then get uh, discouraged and just start, stop doing whatever they were trying. Yeah, so definitely that determination again we did see in how you were learning English is what helped you change your life. But I want to talk quickly about, you know, when very often we say you can't be what you can't see. And it definitely feels like, you know, you didn't have that role model next to you of someone who had a career in terms of the career we're talking about. So going into consultancy and then getting promoting very quickly. So what actually made you think about this is what I want to do? I wasn't clear what I want to do. So I knew that I want to have a good lifestyle, right? And I was counting backwards in terms of how I can have a good lifestyle. Now, a job is a good opportunity to do so. I can't say I met anyone who did consultancy or who did consultancy in technology or who moved from Russia to UK and in many of the cases I was just trying, I was seeing some sort of result or outcome. Sometimes it was positive, sometimes it was negative, and I would adapt my behavior, right? In summary, I applied to around 500 jobs in the UK about seven years ago, and I applied to different jobs. So it wasn't just consulting, it wasn't just technology, and there was perhaps not so much strategic thought at the time you know, can I, is it better to go to financial services? Is it better to go to do technology? Is it better to do this? Is it better to do that? I just thought I have an opportunity potentially to move. I have an opportunity to earn better. It may be very frightening and many and very different from where I am, but I didn't know, right? So I tried and tried and tried for a very long time. I got an offer from three companies at the time and then I moved to UK. You moved to the UK and how did you manage to get from a graduate to a senior manager in six years? This is such an impressive achievement. Yeah, I guess, again, the answer would be that I worked hard. But I do want to recognize that the first three years, I was not very, very successful. I would put it this way. So I used to do a good job. I used to, well, I would say do an excellent job, but nobody seemed to notice it that much. And actually, I wasn't progressing well the first three years. I was like on the minimum salary for a graduate uh, which isn't that high, I guess, compared to other wages. And then it somehow picked up and I got promoted to next level, then to next level, then to next level. And I guess now Oliver Wyman is another promotion. So technically, I've had maybe four promotions over the last three and a half years. I, I would probably say that there are a few things which I changed 
Number one was my mindset. And it was literally thinking that you can achieve it. It doesn't matter that you haven't seen anyone else achieve it. It's just literally thinking, even though I'm an analyst, I could actually pick up some additional skills and be a manager, right? Or if I'm a manager, I can look at partners, I can learn from them, and I can move up the chain to be a senior manager or director. So these are things like this. And again, it's very similar to my mindset in terms of trying to do something and then trying and seeing if it works, it works. And then perhaps it doesn't work. And in many of the cases, I do fail quite a lot. It's not getting too tremendously unhappy around it. It's literally being understanding and positive and having this positive mindset that you can achieve it, you will try again. Maybe it didn't happen, but you try again and again. One of the specifics around myself personally is I don't think I've had many people that would tell me that you are so wonderful or you will achieve it or you will definitely do it, right? So the person who was driving this was just myself. And in a way, I wanted to achieve something to prove other people wrong because they would say, no, 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 this is not possible. This is not possible. This is not possible. You know, this is something I, I was actually wondering about because you clearly come from a completely different background than where you are at today. Do you feel like sometimes you get the imposter syndrome because of your upbringing? I don't really think so. I do have areas where I'm perhaps less comfortable or less confident, but I think I've done many times right now uh, the things which I was told I will never do. <laughs> And I have a confidence on, on the back of it. Right. And I still keep trying and I still fail quite a lot. Yeah. So being comfortable with failure and also remembering the times you you did it right, that that's helping you moving forward, I guess. And I think I'm also quite interested. So I'm really interested, you know, nobody has done this before. or People tell me this is not possible. Let me go and try right? And if I fail, nobody will be surprised because they told me it's not possible. But if <laughs> I achieve something, then it will be like, oh my God. That's very brave. And you know, you said something that I totally relate to, and I'm sure many of the, lis the listeners will relate to as well, is when you said, you know, in the first three years, you were doing an excellent job, but no one seemed to be noticing. This is something that happens so often. And you said you changed your mindset to be able to get out of that. But was there anything else really that made you change the way you were doing things to help you get promoted? Yes. So there were a few things. So number one, I started doing more of self-promotion. And I originally learned it when I got 497 the clients when I was looking for a job. <laughs> So I guess by the time I reached 498th job, I was so fed up with looking for a job that I had to change something. So I think the self-promotion, it's not something when you, you know, have to sell yourself in a way of lying or saying you didn't do something or, or saying you did something which you didn't do. I think it's more the way you approach it. So things like who you show your work to so are they somebody who has who is a decision maker for example so number two it's the way you talk about your work so again you need to talk about it in a positive way and not just portray a picture like I've done it right it's more saying that at the start perhaps there were certain challenges with this and this and this and this and then we overcame them overcame them And actually, it was quite a hard job. You may think it's as simple as, you know, making it happen, but actually it's not. And that's when people start respecting you. And they really, what I found from my sponsors, they really like that you don't just come in and say, I'm perfect and I've done this job very well. It's more like when you really ask for development points, for feedback, and they see that you are continuously working on it to become better. That's really great. What would be your tips for for someone who would like to, to go for their dream promotion? I guess one of the things, it's not really what you know, but it, it's who you know and how you pitch yourself. So I have seen very many people who are really deep technical experts or SMEs, but they haven't been very successful in getting promoted. 
right? And this comes back to my earlier point. You need to be comfortable enough to self-promote yourself. And there isn't anything wrong with self-promotion because you are not lying. You are more just giving visibility to the work you've done and you are talking about it in a positive way, right? So this is one thing. The second thing is making sure that you identify who's going to help you get promoted and get their buying. I've seen some of the exercises from some of the coaches that you look at your stakeholders and you really see this person is green, this person is amber, this person is red. And it's not only you know, seeing how they perceive you, which is really very important, but it's also seeing how much they can support you or help you. Because I've seen very many cases when you do an excellent job, your boss says thank you to you, but then he doesn't actually talk to anyone about it. And it kind of just dies between you and your boss. Yeah. And then you don't get this visibility from other people unless you start doing your self-promotion, of course. Sorry, how do you cr- actually go on and create this relationship with the, the other stakeholders? Because with your manager, it's very easy because you're in communication with, with him or her all the time. But the other stakeholders that could potentially turn into sponsors and help you get that promotion, how do you create that relationship with them? So that's a good question. I would probably say that it's very important to understand first who are the key influences and key decision makers in your promotion. So it can be the boss of your boss or it can be uh, the additional people in the department. I think it's quite easy to approach people in a way that you can have a catch up with them or a coffee. Usually uh, people are quite approachable. I would say it's quite important to talk about your aspiration to get promoted quite early. Say in consulting, I would start doing that a year in advance rather than, you know, two months in advance. I would probably also make these coffee catch-ups not necessarily a fully-fledged agenda meeting, but it's more like a nice, friendly meeting where you can exchange ideas in terms of what you're working on, what is your colleague working on, how you could potentially help each other, etc. Right. I would also probably say that at some point when it comes closer to your promotion period, you may want to check in with your colleagues if they feel that they can support you or, or maybe they can offer you that themselves, depending on the culture of your company. So, these are the ways in which I would approach it without sounding to be too too much, right? And too overwhelming to people. You may find opportunities that you can support your colleagues in a way like your decision makers, your influences in some other way. It can be through extracurricular activities, for example, or it can be doing some part-time project with them. So the there are ways there are ways to do it i think what is important is when you do catch up with them you don't just you know negatively say something oh i'm so tired of my job right you praise the work which you've done in a positive way and and the outcomes which you have achieved and maybe ask their advice their opinion because everybody loves when you ask their advice and even if you may not want to follow it later on it still creates this positive environment agreed and that's definitely something that we tend to put on on the back burner you know we tend to very much focus on our, our work and forget about creating this relationship and as you said it's two months before where we're thinking oh I would like to be promoted and it's too late already so with, with that and then there is the promotion how do you go about and negotiate your salary to be honest in my case I have negotiated salaries in two times so one is when you get an offer from outside and you negotiate at the time of your offer I would say that that's probably an easier route because that's where you tend to be able to negotiate. The second way is when you get promoted internally and, you know, perhaps your salary increase is not sufficient enough or perhaps you don't feel that for all the work you are doing, this is not uh, a fair compensation or perhaps not a high enough compensation. I think you can still negotiate it. Perhaps your chances may be slightly lower because you are already employed and maybe 
your boss doesn't doesn't want to change their opinion. But I think that it is possible. So to answer your point, Karen, I would probably say you again need to be positive about all the work which you are doing and be able to structure your discussion around the positive outcomes which you are bringing to your firm, either your current firm or your future firm, and essentially talk about it in a way that this is all the hard work you are putting in. Uh, this is my track record of doing X, Y, Z, right? I feel that the market is offering whatever it is, right? And this is perhaps a higher number than what I have been offered so far. In many cases, there is room for a negotiation. You can try, you know, and you can get a decline. And I guess going back to my earlier point, you don't need to get very upset if you did get a decline, because sometimes your boss could be very, very, very keen to perhaps give you a pay rise. But there are the wider circumstances in the company which don't let them afford it, for example. I think my COVID being one of them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think one of my advice is generally to try, to try the best you can do, right? To positively structure it, right? And see what is the result. At least you tried, right? And the person has the expectations that perhaps you feel that you are not getting sufficient pay, but maybe they could come compensate in a different way. Maybe they could give you additional mentoring or some support or, I don't know, make your project more interesting. So as long as they understand that you value yourself and perhaps you want to get more out of it, you have this room for negotiation. For all the listeners who are interested in learning more about negotiating your worth, there is a, we also have an episode with Viz Brightby that was in April, if I remember well, from Women in Negotiation. So I also advise you to, to check this out as a compliment to, to what Alina just said. Alina, we spoke about, you know, raising your profile internally and talking to these stakeholders that can help you get to where you want to be. How about your external profile? I was successful for using LinkedIn. I would say LinkedIn is a good tool from the work perspective, in particular in certain countries like UK. I know that in Russia, LinkedIn is banned. That's why maybe it's not the best option. But one of the things which I found with external profile, it's been open to meet these new people, to talk to them about your subject matter, SME, if you have it, or more broader, if you don't have a specific SME knowledge. I found LinkedIn is a good tool. I don't think it's the only, only way to do it, but it was just helping me. I think what I've been trying to do is support different conferences on the topics of cloud and technology and also mentoring women empowerment etc what you will find is you know you may not have any opportunities in the start then you may find one or two opportunities and then the same people will start inviting you to other meetings other conferences other events etc etc you need to start somewhere and you need to start by, you know, offering your support to some of the people around you and then see how it goes. I generally feel that you need to be proactive. So in many of the cases, I didn't have tons of people asking me to do podcasts. So I reach out to people directly when I feel something which they are doing is great and I can contribute to it and make it better. I think when you do reach out to other people, it's, again, you need to have this positive mindset in terms of what you have to offer and how this will benefit them instead of just saying, oh, I want to talk here because I want to talk here. That does take a lot of bravery, though. <laughs> So you mentioned something around supporting people that from your network when you're trying to to raise your profile externally and you're also doing good work is not just about doing good work at your desk and for your company. It's a bit more than that. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, I don't just do a job for a salary. So I do want to help other people. They are not always women. They're not always migrants. They're just anyone who I can really help. And the reason for it is not because KPMG or Oliver Wyman supports volunteering days. 
it's wider than that. I think that when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of opportunities or I didn't see them at the time, right? And nobody actually came to me and offered some support. So it took me a hell of a lot of time and attempts to find something, try something, challenge myself, fail, and try and try and try, right? And it was very difficult for me. It was not like, you know, I tried and suddenly my dream job happened and my dream promotion happened and my dream move happened, etc. So it took, it, it really takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of encouragement or if you don't have encouragement, you get very discouraged, right? And it's quite hard. I think what I really feel helps other people is when somebody comes to you, taps you on the shoulder and says, you can do it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they may not be there right now, but they will believe it most well. They they will want to achieve something, and this word of encouragement would help them. And I think it becomes even more powerful when it's not just the words "you can do it" because that's maybe like a Nike slogan, mm -hmm. but it's more that you know somebody can tell you, you know, these are the ways you could consider doing it. These are the ways you could think about it, and you don't have to follow the same path because everybody has a different path. But you can see, you know, people tried it in this way. These are the lessons learned. People tried it in this way. This is how they failed. And you have some sort of a perspective. And what I want to do through mentoring, and I've been supporting a number of nonprofit organizations, is to give this perspective of what you can do. And, you know, if people want to follow it, that's great. If not, it still gives them a perspective of how they could proceed. And this saves them from these numerous hundreds and thousands attempts of trying, trying, trying without knowing what you can achieve. That's actually really great. Thank you so much, Alina, for joining me on the Women in Data podcast today. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Women in Data podcast. We will be back in a couple of weeks with a new guest. Until then, if you have two minutes, it would be great if you could leave us a rating or a review as it helps not only to make the podcast more visible, but also to enhance the content. If you don't want to miss the next episode, follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are also on LinkedIn. And if you wish to, you can even register to the community for free. All you have to do is head to womenindata.co.uk. Have a great day.